welcome everyone to the first episode of welcome. the gruel cast hi this is no nutrition november day 24 and i'm your host brian of the youth i'm excited to introduce our first guest tori of i'm gonna say it now on tiktok tori why don't you introduce yourself hello i'm tori I'm All right, that's great. Uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> the best was there was a little bit of lag <laughs> on you there. Like, it just peaked, actually. Uh, now you're good. Now you're good. But for a second there, you were okay. going in, like, slow motion. Um, but, Rad, oh, uh, you got your gruel, right? Gruel. Yeah. All right, I got mine right here, too. First step. Oh, yeah. thick. I made mine too thick. <laughs> Let's hop right into the question. So first off, how did you make your gruel? I made it with malto meal, which is a, I guess it's basically cream of wheat. Um, at, Cause I was, I was like, gruel is just runny porridge and I already like malto meal. So I just made malto meal and made it thinner and prepared it the way I normally eat it with uh, brown sugar, cinnamon and butter and a little bit of nutmeg to be fancy not bad not bad now how would you broadly describe fill out in five words or under actually you know what honest... um, can i tell you about <laughs> I tell you about my gruel first yeah tell me about the gruel yeah so i made uh kind of my standard gruel lately I, it's actually made using flapjack batter to give it a little more protein so oh, nice. i mix that with water boil it uh, add a little bit of salt, a little bit of cumin, and a little bit of paprika. Those are the seasonings that I like the most, and give nice. it a nice spice to it. Yeah, yeah. A little savory. All right, so, how would you describe Philip in five words or under? So empathetic, honest, intense. Actually, you know, I don't think I've I don't think I've ever actually had porridge before. <laughs> I mean, I guess oatmeal is a porridge. Just like I guess you classify hot any hot cereal as a porridge. That's the thing is like it's all tech like it's all gruel, right? It's all, it's all gruel. Right? It's all gruel to me. It's all hot grain with I don't know. Does it all have gluten? There's no gluten. Well, oatmeal doesn't have gluten. Oatmeal's gluten free, right? I think it's just any like any kind of grain. Yeah. Because you can yeah, make you can do it with corn too. You can do it with rice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think like yeah. at there's a corn gruel that uh originated with the aztecs like yeah. cornmeal yeah 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 i actually got a recipe for that uh, i think atole it's called from one of my mutuals yeah i'm gonna make it for one of the other days in uh in this in this challenge i'm doing i've heard about it it sounds tasty all right so how would you describe billows broadly in five words or less empathetic honest intense poetic dork that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And, uh, that's good. All right. What if I didn't limit you to five words? Oh, if you didn't limit me to five words, I'd be here for hours. Um, mm. He's a lot. Um, <laughs> All right. No. That's good. Underrated. That's good. That's the he's, point of this. Uh, that's the point of this. This interview. Yeah. Um, he's incredibly underrated, in my opinion. Um, smart uh funny um <laughs> other words um <laughs> yeah. yeah let's see if we can hit 20. let's see if we can hit 20. um yeah. it's so funny no, no, no. <laughs> it's my job here to to guide the question so that we can get more of that fill of juice out so let's get more to the, the actual actual question the... so first question for real for real how do you feel about the fact that Phil Oaks has Scottish blood. <laughs> um, Do you think it's affected his philosophy in any way? I don't know how much it's affected his philosophy. Um, it's affected his voice. It's affected his accent. Um, his mom was full Scottish. Um, and from like kind of born from an affluent family. Um, he also went to Scotland for. He does about have like a really months. Scottish voice, right? Yeah, he has kind like a of a really unique little... voice. Yeah, he he sounds really like almost transatlantic, but not. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. No, I I heard he moved around a lot during his life. 
Uh, yeah, he did. Um, his dad was a medic in World War II, um, so he was an right. army brat. And yeah, they moved around a lot. And then after, yeah, um, I should. I'm gonna go on. <laughs> are, <laughs> hey, are you are you Scottish? Uh, I am a very white cocktail. Um. With a little bit of Scottish, but I'm mostly Swedish. Okay, yeah. Do you think Swedish would Swede got along with Scotland? I don't know much about that. I don't know. I think the Swedes kind of kept to themselves for the <laughs> most. Well, do you but think your Scottish you blood has the... affected your philosophy? No. <laughs> so, how about your uh, your name on TikTok, Greenwich Village Idiot? What do you get that? So it's a Greenwich Village Idiot. Um, and Greenwich Village is in New York. It's where um, the Greenwich Village folk music revival happened in the 1950s and 60s, which is which Phil was a part of. And it's kind of a portmanteau of like Greenwich Village and Village Idiot. You know, is that yeah, a, is, is, a, is portmanteau a right, the right word? I don't know. <laughs> I think that's the right word, but you're more verbose than I am. I think. <laughs> Speaking I'm of sure. names of things, how do you name your podcast? God help the troubadour. So Did yeah, I think it's Troubadour. Troubadour. Maybe, maybe Troubadour is is a way to pronounce it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> no, you can tell me. Uh, I'm I'm very bad at cor- I don't like to correct people. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I it makes me feel like oh, well, actually, um. <laughs> yeah, especially so, on such a niche uh, subject. God help as the your troubadour. own work. Yeah. <laughs> God Help the Troubadour is a lyric from one of Phil's songs, uh, the song Chords of Fame. And it's mm. the full line is, um, I can see you make music because you carry your guitar, God, but God help the troubadour who tries to be a star. Mm. So oh, the, damn. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the full title is God Help the Troubadour, the Eternal Voice of Phil Oaks. Mm, um, that's super cool. So... I'm going to hit your curveball here. What can people expect in uh, episode one of your podcast? Don't feel like you have to give anything away if you don't want to, but I'm just curious. Um, they can expect it's, it's narrative. It's going to be a uh, biographical um, mm-hmm. for the first part as a structure of every episode is going to be kind of the same. Um, mm-hmm. So the first part is going to be more narrative. It's going to be, um, background on his life what he's doing um so first episode starts at his birth uh oh, all right. so, yeah it's I'm a lot of, one lot of full, full episode about the hospital one full episode about the hospital yeah um yeah. the story of the hospital is pretty interesting you'll have to listen to the podcast to hear oh. it oh all right all right there's a lot of interesting stories in the first episode already so you know well, he's I'm an excited ex- <laughs> no I understand Phil was known to be a big fan of the movies of his time. In his younger years, he was particularly a fan of big screen heroes such as John Wayne, Audrey Murphy, Marlon Brando, and James Dean. How do you think these actors influenced Phil? I don't know if it was so much the actors as much as the characters they played. Um, But, you know, they just happened to be the best at their their work at the time, I suppose. Okay, my next question. Um, Fuck capitalism. Yes. Fuck capitalism. Cool. And how about your TikTok name? Uh, my TikTok name is another lyric. It's another song. It's I'm going to say it now, um, which is a song about being a student and dealing with the administration at college or mostly college. Um, mm. And um, there's a great lyric in that song that's, You'd like to be my father, you'd like to be my dad, and give me kisses when I'm good and spank me when I'm bad. <laughs> but since I've left my parents, yeah. I've forgotten how to bow, so when I've got something to say, sir, I'm going to say it now. You know, I, I heard Phil uh, kind of made the distinction a lot that he didn't write protest songs, he wrote topical songs. Why was that? I think it's because um, a protest song is a very specific thing, and... Um, he started out as more of a journalist, um, mm-hmm. and he wanted to tell stories, and a lot of his songs are... He went to art. Ohio State, right? Yeah, he went to Ohio State. What's the mascot of Ohio State? You know, I actually don't know. 
hang on. I'm going to look this up real quick. Hang on. Ohio State mascot. The mascot of the Ohio State is Brutus Buckeye. What is <laughs> Freaking Buckeye. What is this? Do you not know what you a Buckeye gotta is? A picture, you gotta look up a picture of this guy. He's got like a red and white striped shirt and a baseball cap. This is a big face. Oh no. That's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen anything like oh, that. No. <laughs> oh no. Oh uh, no. I don't like if Brutus you see this, I would recommend looking up Brutus, Brutus Buckeye. <laughs> I wonder if he, do you think he was around when Phil was at the college? Uh- <laughs> Just just walking around, or just was he the mascot? Well, I'm assuming he was, like, alive back then, and now he's the <laughs> was he alive? Uh, yeah. First seen 1965, so Phil wasn't there when Brutus Buckeye came about. What was their, uh, maybe their um, description? Anthropomorphic Buckeye nut. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, no, that's, <laughs> that's a really good college mascot. It's unique, I'll give it that. Brutus so being anthropomorphic you... Buckeye nut. I, I hate to take the conversation away from Brutus because he really is the true star of the show. But yeah, how exactly. do you think Bill would have felt about Gru? Um, so it's a good, I mean, it's a, I wouldn't call it a substantial meal. It's just uh, a good working class meal. I think mm. Phil would think that uh, people deserve better, like something mm. more substantial, more nutritious. Um, but you think I don't Bill think wouldn't would... be proud of me for doing what I'm doing. Uh, actually, no, I think he would be, um, uh, because you're kind of putting yourself in the shoes of someone who is poor or okay. maybe perhaps poorer than you are. You don't think that, <laughs> that was really would have thought that I'm just gentrifying culture? I don't think so. <laughs> I highly doubt that. Um, he was he was very empathetic, so I think he would have appreciated um, you doing an experiment like that. What about hardtack? Do you think he'd like hardtack? I think he'd feel I think he'd feel similarly about hardtack. Just people deserve something. People deserve better. Okay. But okay. at the same time, he wouldn't like disparage anyone for eating it. Thank you, Phil. So it's my understanding that Phil was heavily influenced by his friendship in college with Grim Glover when he was at Ohio State with the the nut guy. Yeah. Uh, but they never worked together professionally. Can you give us a little insight into their dynamic? Yeah. Um, there's, a again, another interesting story about them in the podcast. Um, but, yeah, um, if Phil didn't meet Jim, he probably would not have gone into folk music or protest music topical music anything like that because before that he was pretty much apolitical um all country and rock and roll music um didn't know about folk until he met jim glover um Mm. but yeah they they did they um broke up before their first commercial gig so they they had a little they had a little duo called the sundowners um with jim on banjo and phil on guitar Mm. They would do some of Phil's songs, maybe some of Jim's songs, and, like, Kingston Trio shit. So, yeah. Do you think we should bring back the word Hootenanny? I think we should bring back Hootenannies as a thing, period. Um, so what is what is a Hootenanny? Explain this to me. I talk about this in the second episode of the podcast, whenever that oh. gets made. Um, but a Hootenanny is <laughs> kind of essentially like a jam session for... Mm musicians it's very it's very intimate thing it's it's like an open mic um but it's a little bit more closer more intimate um just song swapping having a good time um so yeah i think i think we should bring back hoot nannies period because uh at, maybe not right now during the pandemic but like um just as a as a concept it'd be fun okay. maybe we could do yeah. like zoom hoot so. nannies zoot zoom nannies, hoot nannies. Zoot zoot nannies. nannies. That's pretty good. I would probably attend several Zoom nights in my time. Yeah. So, what do you think about the the state of Mississippi? Um, I I've never been there. Um, I don't I don't have any opinions about Mississippi currently. Um, in fact, um, when Phil wrote "Here's to the State of Mississippi," uh, another folk singer, Dave Van Ronk 
called him out on it and he was like you're playing into the liberal mindset the south isn't inherently more racist than the north you know um, you know i've been in mississippi but, before yeah yeah it's pretty cool it's pretty cool yeah. i cr- i mean i didn't i didn't enjoy my time in mississippi but i don't blame the people in mississippi for that yeah um i'd rather not went- give any details on on that though uh, he was down there at, at a very tumultuous time. Like, he was there. Um, and, um, you know, that was the thing about Phil, is he kind of put himself right in the action all the time, which is right. very noble of him. Um, but it, it's I can see where both sides are coming from, like Dave and Phil. Um, but honestly, I feel like that song could be written. His is later you know album... Punk is? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think <laughs> Phil would have liked folk punk? I know he worked on Baroque folk, which was like a pop folk hybrid in his early professional years. Yeah. Um. I think Phil would dig uh, folk punk. In fact, I, what d- does Andrew Jackson Jihad count as folk punk? Is that is that a folk punk? Um. I, does, I, don't uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't know a lot of like most modern music i really like violent femmes um but um there's a band called kind of like spitting that i think i would cast classify as folk punk and they did a cover album of phil's songs they also did a really good uh tribute song to phil called sheriff oaks that i really like what about like what about like classic punk like hard punk do you think phil would like that i don't know how he'd feel about the sound um but I think he'd love the sentiment, um, and I I consider Phil almost like a godfather of punk. Like you could yeah. listen to a lot of his, especially his early stuff, like that angry, that angry early stuff. In fact, that angry early stuff is very reminiscent of folk punk's sound mm. today. Um, but you know, just that energy behind it, I think he would appreciate that and he'd appreciate the passion. Absolutely. Speaking of Phil's legacy and his effect on the music world, a lot of people seem to like Bob Dylan more. You know about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, don't get me started on Bobby. Um, yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> he, he and Phil seem to have a pretty tumultuous relationship. He's on record as saying both, I just can't keep up with Phil. He keeps getting better and better and better. And also, you're not a folk singer. You're a journalist. Right before throwing him out of the limousine. Um, yeah. What, what's your thoughts on their rivalry dynamic? That was kind of before and after Bob got famous, um, and I. <laughs> so it was more. I think he he like either became arrogant or a lot of a lot of Bob fans will will justify it saying you know he was an asshole to everybody because he just didn't want them. He was doing everything he could to uh, protect them from the fame. Mm. And the spotlight and the you know yeah to keep them away from himself yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. um how noble you know, of him um, so the gaslight manager sam hood according to him at least in the, the gaslight in, manager yeah uh the gaslight the guy who's uh, in charge of gaslighting people yeah the guy who's in charge of gaslighting no um there okay. was a club in uh in greenwich village in the 60s called the gaslight where oh. um folkies would play um comedians and it, it no, was like a there uh, is a lot of um gaslighting in the folk punk community from what i hear in the uh, yeah kind of like the blow-ups on on artists who like did bad stuff you know so do, do yeah. you think do you think phil likes gaslighted people do i think phil likes gaslighting people yeah. no phil was was almost um maybe too honest sometimes to the point of mm. oversharing so i don't think he was into gaslighting Besides, all right, well, yeah, Pat- yeah, all right. So this gaslight, <laughs> this, this gaslight manager. Yeah, uh, gaslight manager Sam Hood uh, said that um, Dylan kind of toyed with Phil because he knew how much Phil admired him and wanted mm. to, you know, kind of reach his status as a songwriter. And find hard to get. Yeah, yeah and, and he kind of like wouldn't give him his due and i feel like he kind of still doesn't give him his due and that may be at some he may be silent out of guilt because it would make him look like a bad guy but i'm i kind of rather much rather see him kind of admit fault and like show some humility hey who do you think would win in a fist fight phil or bob dylan 
Phil hands down, but I think he loved Dylan too much to fight him. <laughs> okay, what if they like took out part of his brain? They like like <laughs> they took out like his frontal like, lobe. Uh, yeah, they just make him like a Bob Dylan killing machine. Make him a Bob Dylan killing machine yeah. without without his empathy. He wasn't Phil, so I don't know. Um, so I you mean, think he maybe then that would have been his downfall. The one thing that would allow him to fight Bob Dylan is the thing that would make him lose. Yeah. It's pretty poetic. So, are there any copies of Phil's songs that you wish you could hear a clean copy of? Yeah. I, uh, I see you mention on your TikTok sometimes that you, you find a recording and it's just the only one out there. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, there's You Can't Get Stoned Enough, which is one of my favorite songs ever of mm. his um and there's another one that i found like this year and it's called keep the change and it also sounds like it was recorded with a ham sandwich and mm. uh i really would like to hear a clean copy of that i feel like they live at the woody guthrie center so hopefully one day they'll release them all right i heard a lot of uh phil's music was burned in the big universal fire a couple years back yeah that was a lot that was the master tapes for albums mm. i did no idea which albums i assume mm -hmm. greatest survived because um yeah. the rehearsal track for no more songs was on um by the way greatest hits isn't a greatest hits album it's, <laughs> it's right, i album. was about to mention that that's that was an album of all new releases right yeah yeah um but yeah his song no more songs there's a rehearsal track for it on that they just released on this new best of the rest album that's got a bunch of like unreleased tracks on it yeah. um what is witty witty album naming and witty <laughs> lyrics Phil was a pretty funny guy don't you think oh yeah no I he could have been yeah. yeah you know Bo Burnham? Lot... Hmm? Uh, yes Bo actually i met him yeah. <laughs> um what <laughs> yeah yeah wait wait hang on Pause the interview. You've met Bo Burnham? Yeah, I met Bo Burnham. That's sick. Oh my god. I've all I've literally like thought in my head about what I would do if I ran into Bo Burnham because he's like one of my one of my favorite musicians. Oh yeah, he's excellent. Um yeah, I um I met him when I was like sixteen. Um I saw him in Iowa City um after my around my sophomore year of high school. Um but yeah, um, he's really cool. I'm now <laughs> um, extraordinarily jealous of you. Back to I've the got interview. an autograph hanging on my wall, actually. Back to the interview. Back to the interview. I'm already jealous enough. Um, <laughs> do you think Phil would have liked Bo Burnham? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, in fact, um, recently I said straight white man is like, love me, I'm a liberal for the 2010s. It's very <laughs> reminiscent of that. Um, I think he loved the the satirical nature of Bo Burnham and the, the very smart uh, style. I think he'd be into it. Was Bo, or sorry, was Phil ever critical <laughs> of the uh, music industry as a whole, as uh, oh, yeah. Bo is sometimes in his songs? Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, there's a there's a there's an interview that you can do, a broadside interview that's just about how um, there's a whole, he says, there's a whole network of corruption in the music industry that's, you know, making, that's turning music into garbage and, like, everything's on, like, a downhill slope and, um, and, like, how the corruption in the music industry is, like, a metaphor for the corruption in the United States. Um, <laughs> you can see, I've listened to the so interview while going to sleep. Networks so. <laughs> of corruption, huh? Do you think Phil would have been a fan of QAnon? Oh, God, no. You don't think so? <laughs> Are you not a fan of QAnon? Okay. Okay. I was just curious. Hey, wasn't Phil's manager his brother? What's up with that? Yeah, um, he was managed by his brother Michael. Um, he, Ma Michael was his third manager. He started out with um, with Bob Dylan's manager at first, mm. uh, Albert Grossman, and then he moved to his friend uh, Arthur Gorson, um, and then. After that, he called up his brother and he was like, I want you to be my manager. I want you to be my personal manager <laughs> as well. Oh, um, hang on. It was so did, weird. Did, did he have Bob Dylan's manager before or after Dylan got famous? Uh, I don't know if it was after. I think it was after Dylan's career had started to take off. Maybe. I think if, if I was Phil, I probably would have been upset if, if Bob Dylan got like super famous while I had the same manager as him. 
<laughs> yeah. And um, then he was like all prick, prissy about it. So he got kind of mad that that um, Grossman was paying more attention, or he thought Grossman was paying more attention to Dylan. I mean, probably made sense because Dylan's career was taking off. But yeah, he wasn't he wasn't too happy, which is why he left uh, Grossman as a manager and went to his his friend Arthur, who wasn't even experienced as a manager. <laughs> But he was like, I want you to manage me. And then after that, like, Art kind of picked up and, like, really liked managing people and started managing more people. And Phil was like, pay more attention to me. And so that's why he kind of moved to his brother. Because, um, you know, he wanted he wanted to be a bit more in the spotlight. And he also, he wanted, he wanted his brother to manage him because he wanted to be able to do what he wanted to do. <laughs> and, um just kind of like creative artistic freedom and he knew his brother was too weak to hold him back <laughs> no i don't know so much about that um but um it's so funny because he had a falling out with michael and all of the all of a sudden mm. out of the blue like two years later he calls him and he's like come to new york and manage me please like <laughs> just hey have you ever mm-hmm. stood in a garbage can like phil did in his 1968 song book the war is over there's a picture of him standing in a garbage can like this I'm absolutely terrified. What? I'm absolutely terrified. You just pulled that. That was so fast. <laughs> Were you just admiring that picture right before, right before this, right before this? <laughs> no. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I just had Wait, it. Wait, can I see know. it again? Can I see it again? Yeah. It's opposite a page of bad reviews. <laughs> hey, not bad. Yeah. Um, can you read us a couple favorite... of those reviews? My okay. Uh, Oaks typifies what I dislike most about modern folk. Um, looks like a porcine version of Elvis Presley, so like a piggy Elvis. Um, <laughs> too bad his guitar playing would not suffer much were his right hand webbed. Fifteenth uh, rate topical songs by a tenth rate journalist. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> King shit. Web but, hand. But, huh? He put himself in a trash can opposite a page of bad reviews. I love him. Um, no, I've never stood in a trash can like Phil, at least not that I can remember. Um, Have you ever but I did. the Eric Andre show? Yeah. So in episode one of the Eric Andre show, there's this bit where he goes onto the street, Eric Andre does, not Phil. Mm-hmm. And he he hides inside of a trash can. And whenever people walk up to you, he jumps out of him and is like, congratulations, you, you're yeah. the only person to use this trash can. <laughs> You think Phil would have liked that? Yeah, I think he'd yeah. very he was very into like absurd humor. I think he'd be a fan. That's cool. That's cool. Do you think My Phil ch- would like me? Yeah. Thank you. I worry. So- I wonder sometimes if he would even like me. So you know, but he was he got along with everybody. So I think you know if you weren't very cool. like yeah. Oh uh, well, I don't know. I haven't I haven't tattooed on me so. I think that's kind of weird. So did Phil get his hands webbed after that review? Did Phil get his hands webbed? No, but um, in in the seventies he broke his arm, apparently, and um, he was on Midnight Special and he made a joke about that, and he was like, <laughs> he, he he mentioned that review and he was like, they were right. And <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, Phil Oaks documentaries out there, right? There are two. Which yeah. one's the best one? Um, narratively, I prefer the one that came out in the 80s. Um, it came out in 1984, and it's called Chords of Fame. Um, and one came out... you prefer it. Yeah. Um, it's more about Phil, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very cheesy, um, and they went with a reenactment. Um, they went with reenactments instead of, like, showing footage of him. They, they flashed pictures on the screen of him, and then they had a guy playing him who looked nothing like him. So, um, <laughs> who played Phil? Uh, Bill Burnett. And Bill apparently Burnett. he is... I looked at his Wikipedia page when I was researching a little video, a little TikTok about the, about the film. Um, and mm. he co-created the show Chalk Zone. Chalk Zone? Chalk Zone. Tell, remember Chalk tell us about the show. Tell us about Chalk Zone. Tell us about Chalk Zone? Well, mm. Rudy's got Chalk. <laughs> that's okay. Chalk Zone. Sounds like a very um, interesting uh, show. Are you 
Do you want to promote Chalk Zone through this interview? Yeah. So right, Chalk cool. Everyone, the, everyone go watch about, Chalk Zone. Yeah, go watch Chalk Zone. I don't know what it's on. Yeah. Um, it's about a kid who who uh, goes into his own li- who draws his own little chalk world. Wait, no, I remember that show. It was on. It was on like the kids' networks when it was I was on like a baby. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, oh my God, I thought it was cool. like. Yeah, the one where the kid like draws a circle or a chalk and walks into it, right? Yeah, yeah, and he's got a friend. I love that show. He's got a chalk friend that he drew, and and he's like, "You gotta draw, Rudy!" Like. <laughs> I used to play with chalk when I was a kid, right on the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. sidewalk chalk yeah. is fun. When you were a kid, would you draw pictures of Phil Oaks with chalk? Would I draw pictures of Phil Oaks with chalk when I was a kid? Uh, no, I probably tried drawing the Beatles. <laughs> With chalk, oh, okay. maybe. So when do you when do you get into the oaks? From infancy. Not physically, uh, metaphorically. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, from birth, my dad played his music from for me from the time I was very very small. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, yeah, I've known about him my whole life. He's kind of been around, um, but I didn't really. Is get... it possible that you heard the music in the womb and just internalized it? Oh, most likely, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, okay. sure uh, my dad, around the time I was born, when I was a baby, he was in. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> keep that in mind. That's probably why I'm like this. Uh, it's my dad's fault that I'm like this. Um, <laughs> um, so did your did I your dad start... know Phil? Personally? Mm, maybe. <laughs> no. Um, no, my dad was a fan. Um, my uncle, his brother, got him into Phil, um, in the 70s, 80s or so. Physically or metaphorically? Hmm? Physically or metaphorically? Metaphorically. Got it, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I heard a lot of his music growing up. Um, in fact, one of my earliest childhood memories, at least earliest political childhood memories is um i have a couple of childhood memories related to phil um yeah one we would listen to him a lot in the car um and the song cops of the world was on and i'd heard it many times i remember being scandalized by the here's a kick in the ass boys lyric um yeah. but i was i think i was maybe like four or five years old and i asked my dad like who are the cops of the world and my dad goes america and i'm like all right yeah. <laughs> so, have you ever um, seen team america world Police? Yes, I have. I think Phil would have liked that movie. I don't know. Yes, probably. Um, yeah. I yeah. Do you like that movie? Um, it's been a long time since I've seen it. <laughs> um, I just watched it like I, two weeks ago. <laughs> I think I saw it good. when I was like, thirteen or fourteen. I don't know. I was. I was pretty, pretty young. young. There's like a really long, like graphic sex scene between puppets. Yeah, but it's 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 puppets. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's true. That's true. I thought it wasn't. I think I think I was. A, uh, do you think that movie um, established like a puppet fetishism in some of America's youth? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, or maybe in America, fetishism in America's youth. There was. I think it was based on there was a, like another puppet like a British puppet show from maybe the eighties or nineties that those the style of puppet is based on and that might have I feel like that was more, probably more like in the zeitgeist at the time it probably initiated some puppet fetishes. Okay, name every one of Phil's albums right now. Uh, camp favorites. All the news is fit to sing. Ain't marching anymore. Phillips in concert. Flood of the harbor. Tape from California. Rehearsals for retirement. Greatest hits. And okay, stop. Fight at Carn- Greatest hits. Right. So on the back of that album, Phil brags that he has a full fifty fans. How many of these fans what? are time loop duplicates of yourself? Like you went back in time a couple of times over and just like bought the album and like all his other work and just like you like how many of his fans were you? If I could time travel back to the 60s, do you think I'd be here talking to you? Well, my thought was maybe you haven't. Also, ouch. I, my thought was maybe was you not- haven't um, like figured out how to time travel yet. So when you do figure that out, you'll go back in time and then you'll then you'll do this. Like it just hasn't happened yet. 
even though that's it has true. Happened. I can't think about this too hard. Time travel is kind of confusing. Then it'll make a paradox and break things. Um, yeah. No, he had a pretty dedicated following at the time um, that wasn't just copies of me. Um, but um, I don't think he just, I, I just don't think he received the nationwide status that he deserved, but he was, he was known, at, especially at the time. Um, Do you think maybe Bob Dylan like, went back in time and stopped Will from getting famous? No, he didn't need his help. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, Do you think maybe the but, CIA went back in time and stopped Will from getting famous? I mean, the CIA was already there and <laughs> were, was doing the best they could. Yeah, to but like future CIA. Future CIA. Bound by nothing, not uh, even time. You know what? That would explain some things. Yeah, <laughs> I thought so. Just something to think about. Hey, is smoking more fun than drinking? Yeah. Yeah. I don't like how I feel when I drink. I get like, I get all sweaty. Yeah. Uh, personally, I, 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 am I allowed to? Are we allowed to talk about this on TikTok Live? Oh shoot! I forgot. Are we gonna? Uh, is, are we gonna like get kicked off? Oh no! <laughs> I don't know. I'm you know sorry. what? We were we were talking metaphors. We were actually talking about uh, apple juice and cranberry juice. Mm -hmm. Personally, I prefer cranberry juice. If I drink apple juice, it gets me just like kind of in my head a lot. Um. But right. when I drink apple juice, um, I, I, it, 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 it loosens you up, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think ironically, Phil preferred, wait, which, which is which in this cranberry analogy? Juice. I've missed. Cranberry, cran, cranberry juice. Okay. Cranberry juice. I think, um, I mean, famously Phil preferred apple juice, mm. um, <laughs> but, um, I think uh, cranberry juice made him a bit paranoid because um, he was already he already like struggled with anxiety a lot, um, and he also wasn't a huge fan of apple juice, or okay. he wasn't a huge fan of, of cranberry juice culture, okay. <laughs> and um, he thought it was it, it helped people kind of like divorce from reality, and he mm. wasn't a huge fan of that or like the hippie subculture. Okay. He thought it was. He thought it was very. He found it very escapist. But he was a bit of a. He was a bit of a hypocrite because he still so, partook. Yeah. So why do you think that Phil wrote in a song that drinking cranberry juice is more fun than drinking apple juice? His song outside of a small circle of friends. I think it was because he still thought he's. He still thought um, cranberry juice should have been decriminalized. In fact, he stated so in an article. Um, and it was more like people shouldn't be sent to jail for it because the rest of the uh, the rest of the song or the rest of the line is um, drinking cranberry juice is more fun than drinking apple juice. Uh, but a friend of ours was a friend a friend of ours was captured and they gave him thirty years. Maybe we should raise our voices, ask somebody why. But demonstrations are a drag. Besides, we're much too. <laughs> so um, in a in a cranberry juice stu stupor. Yeah. Um, this should so, be a cover of the song. This Do you have any plans to make this a cover of the song? To make this a cover of the song, I can now. Yeah. I don't. Know. <laughs> hey, what's in your can favorite Phil Oaks book? Um, favorite. Um, biography or just any book? Mm, let's go with any book. Any book, um, probably this one, <laughs> but there's okay. one just came out this year, which is a compilation of his writing. This is a song book that came out in 1968, which, you know, we mentioned it has the, the, uh, the trash can picture and the reviews, but it's got yeah. lots of his writing. It's, um, it's got poetry. It's got tons of full page pictures and it's a song book. It's a very unique song book. Um, and it's very you pretty. Play music, right? A little bit, yeah. I dabble. Yeah. Okay. You play, I'm not, you I'm play not ukulele. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can you can you play a song right now? Uh, the only one I know by heart is the Highway Man, and it's like very long. <laughs> I got time. At least way out of tune. Ooh, that sounds terrible. 
That's music <laughs> to my ears through this 24-bit connection. Mm. Hey, so I, you said Phil toured a lot in Canada. Did he ever tour yeah. in, in, in the UK? Yeah, he did. He, I think he toured in the UK and Europe in general. He was in Germany. Um, gosh. He went everywhere. I, it's so do hard. Think, do you think that Phil had something to do with the breakup of the Beatles? Do you think he, like, caused it? No. Um, well, he, he met John Lennon after the Beatles had already broken up. Yeah. They broke up in yeah. 1970, okay. I believe. But yeah, he played a benefit for John Sinclair, who was put away for cranberry juice uh, charges. And yeah. um, he played Here's the State of Richard Nixon. And then um, there's a couple of recordings of him jamming with John Lennon in a hotel room. Mm. Um, I think he, he kind of befriended John Lennon around that time. Um, gotcha. But oh. no, Phil didn't pull a Yoko. So what's your favorite Phillips book if it has to be a biography? If it has to be a biography, um, I like There But For Fortune by Michael Schumacher um, because it's a bit more accurate. Um, it has his family's blessing behind it. Um, and the other book is a little bit more sensationalized, I think. Um, it, I don't know. Neither are perfect um, and both make me cry. So... <laughs> If someone could only read like uh, one one sentence to define Phil Oaks, what would you pick? One sentence. Oh God, yeah. put me on the spot. I don't know. Yeah. Um, to define like like a quote yeah. of his, or just like something from the book, or no, just like just a just a sentence. I mean. I'd probably go with um, a quote of his that's like, that's um, in such an ugly time, the true protest is beauty. I think Damn, uh, that's actually, that's actually pretty poetic. You kind of pulled yeah, through on that one. That. <laughs> hey, what's Phil's zodiac sign? Uh, Sagittarius sun, Leo moon. We don't know his uh, birth time, so I can't calculate his ascendant. Scorpio, Venus, and Mars. Sagittarius, Mercury. Okay. Et cetera. Okay. Are you into <laughs> astrology? Vaguely. I try to be, but um, I'm not, I, I can't understand a lot of it. Um, I know it, it takes a lot of time that I don't what's have. Your, uh, what's your zodiac oh. sign? Scorpio sun, uh, Sagittarius moon, Gemini rising. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the compatibility between Scorpios and Sagittarius. Apparently, they have 1% trust compatibility. 1% trust compatibility. 80% communication and intellect compatibility. 10% emotional compatibility. 35% value compatibility. Uh, 30% shared activities, 30% in total. Do you think that's accurate? I think you have to take in your whole chart as a, as a factor rather than like just your sun signs. Okay. Be that's yeah. the, that's generally that's true. The that's, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, it matters kind of how your Venus and Mars work together. Like he has a Scorpio Venus and I also have a Scorpio yeah. Venus. Um, why am I talking well, about or I've like up, your communication. I've looked up, um, I've looked up my zodiac sign. I'm an Aries, mm -hmm. and I actually have a 95% sexual, sexual and intimacy compatibility with Sagittarius. Do you think me and Phil could have like <laughs> tied the knot? You know, um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, we also have 70% trust compatibility, 90% communication. <laughs> wow, these are all high figures. We got us eighty-seven percent overall. Maybe I should be the Phillips <laughs> professional here. Yeah, maybe today. maybe you should. I should just like maybe this has been my calling. Maybe I, this you. the whole point of this interview was for me to take take you take your yeah, hobby. Yeah, it's good. You know, whatever you can have it. Do vaccines you. cause autism? No. <laughs> okay. So Phil's song "Crucifixion" builds parallels between Jesus Christ and John F. Kennedy and more broadly, America's romanticization of the sacrificial death of heroes. What yeah. are your thoughts on this idea, and do you feel this cycle was furthered by Phil's life at death? I think, um, I think he's right. Um, I think we do kind of make messiahs out of people, and 
um, sensationalize their death and, and especially, you know, what leads to their death um, and, and forget a lot of the time what they stood for. Um, like, I think it happened to Woody Guthrie, uh, happened to Martin Luther King. Um, you know, it happened to people even after he wrote Crucifixion in 1965, uh, happened to Bobby Kennedy. He even played Crucifixion for Bobby Kennedy on a plane uh, once. Fun fact. Um, or he sang it to have his guitar with him. But um, yeah, and I do think a lot of the time, ironically, it applies to Phil. I think a lot of um, his songs ended up being kind of prophetic about him, um, about himself. Um, and I'm probably guilty of it too. I try not to, I, I try not to sensationalize his death. There's a, um, there's a lyric in Crucifixion that's, um, um, you know, I predicted it. I knew he had to fall. How did it happen? I hope his suffering was small. Tell me every detail for I've got to know it all. And do you have a picture of the pain? Um, I feel like that. Hey, who do you think would win in a fist fight? Jesus or JFK? <laughs> Well, JFK was Catholic, so I don't know if he'd want to fight Jesus, but I feel like if they had to, JFK would probably win, and I'm going to hell. Um, well, Phil, but... Phil Oaks was Jewish, so I think he has a right to fight Jesus. Who would you think would win that fight? I, I, I feel like he'd get along with Jesus. That's the thing. I don't know. I don't think he'd want to fight Jesus, but yeah. I mean, Jesus, uh, Jesus no, would... Fine. No, oh, no, God. no. You don't have to answer the question. Waits. I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm no. trying to answer I'm, your question I seriously. You don't, want, you don't want to answer the question. I'm trying to answer it seriously. I'm thinking. Of, okay. I'm thinking critically. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I Phil Phil lifted weights. Um, it depends on like what time, <laughs> what time of his life it was. Let's for say Phil. peak Phil and peak Jesus. Peak Phil, peak Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter. Um, so he probably. Mm. And and if Jesus had the if if Jesus had was actually the Messiah and had powers, he probably could win. But I don't think. Do he you think would. Jesus had fight related powers? What? Do you think Jesus had fight related powers? I mean, I I suppose he could turn like the water into blood into wine, and then they would just like fall over in a stupor. That's terrifying, oh, actually. Yeah, that is terrifying. Yeah, this um, is pretty. He's a pretty strong guy. Yeah, I think he I think he could do it, but again, you know, he was all turning the other cheek, so he'd probably lose on purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um okay. and I don't think Phil would fight him, so you know. <laughs> well reason. Okay. I mean, I'll take that with a grain of salt. How often does the average Phil fan experience sudden extreme existential dread? About four. Hey, what the flip was Pegasus the immortal? Uh, Pegasus was, yeah. so, uh, are you familiar with the Yippies, or the Youth International Party? Uh, yes, but tell me about okay. them. Yeah, they were co-founded by, uh, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and Phil Oaks. Um, okay. And, um, they were very much into the politics of the absurd. So, when they went to Chicago in 1968, the Chicago Democratic National Convention, um, they decided they would nominate a pig for president. In fact, I've got mm. a little button that says Pegasus 2020 here on my hat. Um, would you vote for Pegasus 2020? Hmm? Would you vote for Pegasus 2020? Yeah, I wrote them in. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> yeah, I wrote in, I wrote in Pegasus. Uh, Phil bought the pig, actually. Right. Um, All right. Go yeah. Phil. Yep. Um, there's a really cute story around that too. When they went to the farm to buy the yeah. pig, mm. there was a there was a whole gaggle of puppies there, and okay. uh, really took to him. And at uh, at one point, he just like collapsed into this huge pile of puppies. Mm. So that's, that's a that's great a lot of puppies for you. Yeah. That's that's kind of impressive. I don't think I've ever mm -hmm. been like tackled. The way he was tackled by them. I don't know the, the the story I heard. He just like fell into this pile of puppies okay. just around. Just fell into it. You don't yeah. think that's the coincidence? Just rolling around on the ground. The coincidence. Okay. 
Yeah, like maybe it was like planned. Planned? Yeah, the yeah. CIA planted the puppies there. So who was Pegasus running against when he actually ran? I think he was running against the rest of the nominees, the rest of the presidential nominees. Or the, no, yeah. No, not the nominees. Well, you, the rest what, of the candidates. What, uh, what year was this? 1968. So that was, so, um, that was so McCarthy and Nixon, right? McCarthy, Nixon, uh, Hubert Humphrey. Was it Hubert, Hubert Humphrey, Humphrey was the nominee, ended up being the nominee. Yeah. Who was it? It mm. was, yeah. And no one wanted him. <laughs> um, mm. And Bobby Kennedy was shot before before that. So, right. So uh, couldn't be the nominee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you Bill, think, um, who, would, who do you think would win in the fight, McCarthy or Nixon? You know, I don't know too much about McCarthy besides that that Bill uh, campaigned for him and that he was against the Vietnam War. I think I think McCarthy probably would have won because he wanted it so bad, uh, wanted the end of the war so bad. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. At least that's what I'd root for. At least. Do you think that Pegasus the Immortal Taste did good? Do I think Pegasus the Immortal Taste is good? You know, I don't know what actually happened to Pegasus. Do you think like, I don't know. Eaten? I don't know. I hope not. I bet Nixon ate him. I think. I think the yippies kind of just made him their. I mascot. think that's the rule. Is that like if you lose the presidential election and you're not a human candidate, the winner Yippie. gets to eat you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I've read that in in the Constitution before. Yeah. In fact, I think it applies to humans as well, but it's just kind of customary not to. Right. Right. To show the good grace of the transfer of um, power. Yeah. I mean, well, I was really surprised when when Biden said he wasn't going to use Trump. Or Bernie Sanders, like you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I I need Trump. No, actually, no. That's not kind of. Good. Need, I need Bernie. I need, need Bernie. Trump. Yeah. Would Trump taste like gruel? Trump would probably <laughs> taste like gruel. Trump wouldn't be as good as Gruel. No, no, no. Trump has less nutrition. No. Yeah, that's Gruel. true. So, mm -hmm. Chicago, 1968. What did it change? Everything and nothing. Um, I Can think. You elaborate on I that? think. I think mostly it kind of turned a mirror onto um, police brutality and the corruption in our government. But at the same time, um, it's been 50 years and nothing has changed. So, uh, in fact, yeah. it's probably worse. Mm. So, you know, everything and nothing. Um, yeah. Phil said it was the death of America. Um, so. Yeah. <laughs> Phil, Phil died. In, in Chicago in 1968, right? That's what it says on his album cover. Yeah, that's he's um he. That's my favorite album of all time. Rehearsals for mm. retirement. Um, he put a tombstone on the cover, yeah. and he said he would he's, he he'd always say that he died in Chicago. I think he he just lost he really lost the like idealist part of himself yeah. there. Um. And that was uh that was a couple years before his greatest hits tour, right? Yeah, uh sixty eight. So could you could you explain that specifically the gold suit? Yeah, so um in sixty nine, I wanna say January sixty nine, he's got to see, he got to see Elvis in Vegas and he was a huge fan of Elvis. Um he had a collage of Elvis hanging in his house. Mm -hmm. Um and Elvis had this gold suit and the the 50 fans can't be wrong came from an uh, I think an album cover of Elvis's that was like 50 million fans can't be wrong mm. um that makes so, but he was like this, actually. yeah but he was like I think I think what I think what America needs is for Elvis Presley to become Che Guevara so um mm. so he decided to kind of take on that role and he had Nudie Cohn, who made Elvis's gold suit, make him the same gold suit. And uh, <laughs> and he went on tour, um, and then he, he made Greatest Hits, which is a rock and roll country album. It's probably his mm. most 
That's a bit of a controversial release. A little, little bit, a little bit controversial. Um, yeah. Um, it was. People didn't quite understand it. Um, people really didn't understand the gold suit. Um, and, <laughs> and they were like, "Who are you now? Like, who is this man?" Um, especially <laughs> when he when he toured, he got. He didn't have the best reception at Carnegie Hall, and except the second show, things kind of improved. But um, mm-hmm. uh, that is a wild story that I don't want to divulge too much into sure, because yeah. it's uh, it's Save the juicy bit. Yeah, it's it's yeah. juicy, but like, yeah, it was weird and it was also confusing. It didn't sell very well. A lot of his albums didn't sell very well, um, but. He, he never had a hit and a lot of the times people look at a greatest hits album they're like who the hell is this and like <laughs> i don't recognize any of these songs like yeah. you see this guy on the cover in a gold suit and you're like isn't that that folk singer like what <laughs> why is he in a gold suit with an electric guitar what's going on i love it hey how many times was phil Oaks arrested i don't know the number um i don't think it was i honestly don't think it was that many times i know he was oh. first arrested in florida a couple times when he was a kid yeah. um and i talk about that a little bit on the podcast mm-hmm. um and that was kind of like in his fbi file that was one of the things it's, it's in his fbi file and it's like one of the things that, that they're like oh he's dangerous about but like um I'm, i think he was arrested in chicago during the convention yeah. um and then he was arrested in south america um mm-hmm. and i yeah just was that part for, of his trip to bolivia um it, so he didn't he didn't actually like go to bolivia or that's not where he was arrested i think he was arrested in uruguay mm-hmm. i could be wrong don't quote me on that Mm -hmm. haven't gotten to that point in my research yet so i'm not like fully like certain i'm a little bit more more well versed in the earlier parts of his life for now um but um i think it was uruguay or argentina where he was arrested with his friend david and um the other prisoners were like if they tell you they're taking you to bolivia they're gonna kill you and um and and you're just gonna be you're just gonna be disappeared, like, yeah. He and he didn't I do love anything. Being disappeared. Yeah. Um. Oh, he was also arrested for drunk driving in the early seventies. You mean apple apple juice driving? Apple juice driving. Yeah. yeah um. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> um. Yeah. Um. And probably a, a few times toward the end of his life. Um. Actually, he probably got arrested more toward the end of his life um because he was causing a lot of trouble uh then and not the good kind of trouble um yeah um but yeah he was arrested for for nothing for being himself for being a communist in um in south america when uh everything was a mess so yeah his trip to bolivia they they like made they made a bunch of noise apparently when they got to the airport and um airport officials heard it and like the pilot was like okay just stay on the plane they touched down in bolivia and they didn't get off i don't think and um and then they went to peru i think um but they were That's like close call. wait until you get to america because all the police down here work together so um, that's um, like that scene in a war movie where like you think that the main character is about to get murdered but then, like, it just, it's got, like, that rising crescendo, and then it just stops. Remember, every yeah. time. Yeah. It had to be terrifying for him, for sure. Um, yeah, so they were like, wait until America, until you get to America, the American police will take you into custody. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, he narrowly escaped getting disappeared in South America in the 70s. Probably 71? Is when that happened i know in the early uh early 70s probably 1972 1973 i think phil traveled to australia new zealand ethiopia k 
Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, and South Africa. And he was also attacked in Tanzania. Yeah. Um, yeah, Do you he ever was think atta- of replicating his travel plans? <laughs> uh, with my millennial money, no. Um, as as I'll probably go as far as Greenwich Village. Um, but yeah, no. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I. I wouldn't mind if I had the money, but yeah. And I yeah. also, I, I wouldn't want to go to Dar es Salaam because that was where he was strangled. So hmm. that hurt my feelings. Um, hmm. But yeah. 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 I don't know. I've always been kind of averse to going to like Africa because I don't want to do the whole white savior thing, you know, where you go to like a tiny village of a bunch of native Africans and act like you're doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I think I, that certainly wasn't what he was doing at the time. I don't think. Oh uh, no, I don't think so at all. No, no. Um, but I heard he recorded you know, a uh, single in in uh, South Africa, actually. Yeah, he recorded a single in Africa. Um, he Watuwe and uh, I have the single actually. Hold on. <laughs> oh, all right. Is it it's the one where... he recorded? Yes, it's the one he recorded. Well, it's not. It's not a first pressing. This is a. Mm. This was, for, a repressing from the Phil Oaks fan club of Canada. One of our uh, viewers would like to point out that the landscape of Africa is beautiful. Yeah, um, yeah. in fact, I would agree. I would agree. Graphic is new pretty. Book, They've got lions too. I think. They've got lions too. Yeah, he also went to Indonesia. Um, he was in Bali and. There's a travel, an excerpt from his travel journal in the new book that came out this year. I'm going to say it now. And he writes how he writes about how beautiful it is. And um, he said, it, what did he say? It reminded him. I think it's, he said he remind it reminded him of Haiti, like just the environment out there. Um, but yeah, he wrote, recorded Watuwe and Nico Mchamba Ngombe. Watuwe is in... Swahili, mm-hmm. Nico Mchunga Mchumba Ngombe is in Lingala. I hope I'm mm-hmm. pronouncing that semi correctly. Um, but yeah, it was. Okay, I expect no proper pronunciation. He kind of recorded it as a. Uh, I know what I'm pronouncing Boatwe correctly. Um, I think Boatwe means canoe. Um, but he's uh, he recorded down there because he <laughs> for like a tax write off because <laughs> he was like I want to travel. But like, I want to make it cheaper. So like, yeah, right. so he was like, let's record something. Um, right. And accidentally, he became probably the first American to uh, go abroad and, and record world music. Um, hmm. Yeah. Going back, right. circling back to Elvis, he was probably the first Elvis impersonator as well. Um. <laughs> hey, he's got a lot of titles, though, including John Butler Train. Who was that? Yeah, um, John Train was, or or Luke Train was another name. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he was an alter ego that Phil adopted. Um, I want to say around the summer of 1975, during a really bad manic period, um, because you know he was he was bipolar. Um, and bipolar disorder cycles um and his apple juice problem uh really progressed um into the 70s really badly so um he said that um john train uh phil oaks and um and then um it just because phil oaks was wasn't effective and and was (laughs) Wrote some good songs, but um, but was garbage and um, boring old fart, according to Phil. Um, but uh, yeah, Train was a was a tough time. It some people think Train was like a dissociation kind of thing, like a multiple personalities kind of thing. Um, I don't I don't know too much about that. I feel like he's more. He was more of an intentional thing to start out with, but you know, at the same time, he was extremely manic and um, 
it train was train personality wise was kind of the opposite of Phil Oaks. So his whole life right. had been um, really kind and empathetic and sweet in general and kind of got along with everybody. Train was violent and, and belligerent and mean. Mm. And, um, and I mean, and Phil, when he apple juiced, <laughs> um, it would, his, would get that way. Some, would, would become that way sometimes, um, especially heavily when he was drinking juice heavily. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, kind of going kind of rambling now no you're cause... fine if you don't mind i've got an excerpt from a biographer about phil's unaliving thoughts near the end of his life uh, if you don't mind yeah that's fine by phil's thinking his life had ended a long time ago it ended politically in chicago in 1968 in the violence of the democratic national convention it ended professionally in africa a few years later when he had been strangled and felt that he could no longer sing it ended spiritually in Chile, or sorry, when Chile had been overthrown and his friend Victor Javar, had, uh, Jara, did I say that right? Victor. Victor Jara, had been brutally unalive. And finally, it ended psychologically at the hands of John Train. Do you think this is a fair framing of Phil's perspective near the end of his life? I don't think it's entirely inaccurate, but I think it's a little bit oversimplifying. Um, he was extremely troubled internally and i think suffering blow after blow at the end of the 60s and in the 70s certainly didn't help um he just he just kept taking hits um around that time and you know the fbi was on his trail and um he knew as early as 60 68 uh, he, no, he, he knew pretty early on that he was being monitored by the FBI and the CIA, and he would, like, mm. even even at concerts, he'd, like, do shout-outs to agents in the crowd. Um, but, you know, it, it, just imagine being paranoid and being right. He had this, like, kind of... Toward the end of his life, he had this kind of psychosis thing where he was extremely paranoid, but, like, at the same time, he was being monitored, you know, right. by the government. So that can that can really wreak havoc on someone's brain. Um, and he already had internalized in, internal mental health problems. His dad was bipolar, um, and you know he kind of adopted that yeah. from him. So yeah, I don't think I don't think it's an accurate. Um, and you know he said you know uh, John Train also ended part of his life as well mm -hmm. um so you know by the by the end he was he was pretty pretty much gone um probably by uh winter of 75 he started to improve a little bit around that time and then he uh moved in with his sister uh the beginning of 1976 um and that's where he stayed until so Phil ended his life in 1976, and it was revealed years later that the FBI had a near 500-page file. Do you yeah. believe the U.S. government had a hand in Phil's death? I, in... I know that's, that's a bit of a big one. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's a, it's a common conspiracy theory is like... Mm the CIA are the people that unalived him, but logistically it couldn't have been anyone but him. Um, he only had a really short window of time where he was alone. Um, but I don't deny that um, he, he thought, he thought that the CIA attacked him in Africa and that's what, you know, they, he was, and they like, crushed his vocal cords right and it was like why would they why would they do that like why would they mm -hmm. attack that part of me specifically yeah. if they didn't right. who I would? um so i am not completely ruling out that possibility that the cia was involved in that and that it was just like a botched like botched 
on a live attempt. And, you know, I think, I think they were complicit, but not directly responsible at the end. So after his death, Phil Oaks was honored by Congresswoman Bella Abzu, as well as many of his former critics and colleagues. And over 40 years after his time, Oaks' songs are still very relevant. And Oaks continues to influence singers and fans worldwide. There are mailing lists and online discussion groups dedicated to Oaks and his music and websites that have music samples and photographs and other links. And articles and books continue to be written and published about him. However, these forms can be disorganized a bit and sprawling and difficult to get into. So for a deep look at the full story of the life of Phil Oaks, tune into Tori's podcast, March of the Troubadour, a collaborative labor of love bringing together the work so many have put into remembering and honoring this great man. March of the Troubadour premieres December 19th, and I know I'll be listening. You can find links to the rest of Tori's social media presence in my link tree. And Tori, thank you so much for coming to the show. And I hope you enjoyed the grill. I did. Thank you. Oh, I also saw it. Well, oh. <laughs> but uh, thank you for watching. Uh, this is the end. Tori, do you have anything else to say before we go? God I help the as you, I asked you that question <laughs> as you have grill in your mouth. All right. It's fine. Thank you for watching, everyone. First episode. December 19th. Woo! <laughs>